Let's read from Romans chapter 5. And it starts with therefore. And it's kind of like, remember all the things that we read before? Taking all of that account, we're going to keep going. Paul is telling us something. So we read before in our series in Romans that we were sinful. We are sinful. But God sent his son Jesus to take on the punishment for us, to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead so that we can believe in him by faith, get saved. And now we're in chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who, who has been given to us. Amen. Now, just to address the fear and hope that just arose in the room, I will not be hula hooping today. That's what you thought was about to happen. <clears throat> uh, my name's Josh. Uh, I'm one of the pastors of our church. So let me pray for us. Father, we've just heard you speak to us in your word. May we hear you. Have your word settled deep into our hearts. Transform us. That we might have real and lasting hope. And we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I am a strong and capable man. I am a strong and capable man. Now, this is the mantra of Colin from Ted Lasso, one of the soccer players in the show. Uh, I love this character. He's great. And uh, he worked out this little mantra with the team psychologist to help him through sucking at playing football. It helps him face the future. It helps him deal with the situations he's afraid of. I am a strong and capable man. Now, I want to ask you, do you have a mantra? Do you have a boast? You know, something that you say to yourself to get yourself up, to get you going, to help you to face those hard situations in life. Now, this passage that we've just heard gives us a boast. Not like a, uh, like a humble brag, not like an into-yourself kind of thing but a genuine, life-directing, hope-bringing boast. And that's what we're going to see today. We'll see what this boast is and why this boast will not put us to shame. So first, let's see this boast together. You know, when soldiers used to go into battle, I think that probably still happens, but, but knowing they would die, or they might die, they would make great boasts. So they could stir up their courage and the courage of the soldiers on their, on their side so they could actually go and fight. Um, there's lots of famous stories about this, but one would be um, the moment at the Battle of Mount Vesuvius where the famous gladiator, Spartacus, led his forces. And uh, as the Roman army called across to them, surrender, Spartacus called back, greatly overmatched, I am Spartacus. And what a boast. <laughs> and all the guys next to him thought, oh, I like that. I am Spartacus. And I am Spartacus. And so it went. And they fought back. But think of another man around the same time in a different situation. This man's name was Titus Flavius Clemens. And he was a member of the Flavian family dynasty that ruled the Roman Empire from 69 to 96 AD. So you're thinking like 30 odd years after Jesus, right? Now he was a Roman consul and a senator, so he's at the very top 
of the greatest empire in the world. He's related to the emperor through his wife. And according to historians, he was killed, AD 95, by the emperor. Why was he killed? He was killed for atheism, which means he refused to worship the emperor and the Roman god. Now, why did he do that? This man at the, at the centre of Roman life, the pinnacle of the world's greatest power. He did that because he'd come to follow Jesus and believe that Jesus was the Son of God. So he refused to worship the emperor. Now, this man, Titus Flavius Clemens, lived in Rome. The letter that we're reading was written to the church in Rome. He would have read this letter. He would have heard this in his church on Sundays. And this would have formed his boast for that moment. Did you hear the words of this letter? We boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. And so as Clemens was standing before his executioner, he made a boast. This, this joyful proclamation to himself and before his witnesses in front of the emperor. He said this, Today I shall be killed as a Christian, but tomorrow I shall rise again as Christ's own. Do you see his boast? We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, what is it exactly that he is boasting in? What is it exactly that Paul is saying, you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you boast in? What is this glory of God that we're hoping for? Well, it's the hope that after we die, Christ will raise us from the dead and will be transformed so that we'll be like him, God's risen son. See, when God made us, he made us in his image, we're, we're to reflect what God is like in the world. But from the very beginning, Adam, the first person, people from him, we have fallen from sin. We don't reflect what God looks like. Think of like the moon in the sky, right? When the moon is shining brightly, it's reflecting the brilliance of the sun, like a little sun. Not the sun itself, but like a little sun. So you get an image of what the sun might be like. But when the moon turns away, and doesn't reflect the sun, it's gone dark. The moon is still there, but it's gone dark. It's similarly for us. When we no longer know God, love God, in relationship with God, reflect Him, we're like the moon that's gone dark. Sinful people who've rejected God can't reflect the holiness and goodness of that God. But, Paul says, when Christ returns, here's the great hope. All those who believe in Him will be raised to a new life. We'll be back again like the moon. People who reflect the image of God. Just think about what that means for a second, what this hope is, right? So your very body made new. A body that's sown perishable is going to be raised imperishable, never to die again. You go from mortal to immortality like Christ. Not only that, but your inner self, your heart, your life changed so that we completely love God and love one another through the power of the Holy Spirit. And our relationships changed. Now we will dwell with God forever. Isn't that an incredible thing to hope for? A hope beyond death. A hope that goes into eternal life. A hope that's power of power and glory as we were made like Jesus, the one who God raised from the dead. Now, doesn't that turn us from the boasts we make in life to something that's far greater. Like, we have the Colin sort of boasts, right? Yeah, I am a strong and capable man. But the Christian boast is so much different. It's, no, I will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what do you tell yourself? What, what do you say to yourself to get yourself up, to get yourself going, to face the day? What is your boast? Can I ask you, is it actually some version of Collins? I am a strong and capable man. Is it, is it I am Spartacus? Uh, 
Because so often that's the temptation. That's the default. We, we boast in ourselves. Our boast is, I can do it. I can do it. We say these mantras to ourselves. I can do it. You can do it. You've got this. I remember reading The Barefoot Investor. And uh, it's a book about how to manage your money, you know, make sensible decisions in life. And the great parable he tells at the start, the story he wants you to, to take hold of, so you can have this, is that he wants you to so manage your money, to so secure your future, that when the day of disaster comes, your job crashes, your house burns down, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I've got this. There it is, right? The, the, the boast in ourselves, oh, I've got this. And one of our kids has a, a little journal that helps him reflect on life. And uh, the first part of the first chapter, just, it's Barefoot Investor for Children. It's, it, 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 but it's, it's Disney. It's everything. It's in the air, very air we breathe. The, the chapter the heading is this, believe in yourself. And it gives you all these mantras to believe in yourself. Because and they, they explain it to you so you know what, why you need to believe in yourself. Because believing in yourself means trusting yourself doing your best to achieve your goal, it makes you stronger and more likely to succeed. Now, this kind of motivational self-talk does do stuff to us, doesn't it? It does, you know, you say things positively, and it does give you a sort of strength to have a go, to try things. I remember when I used to try and train a lot for basketball, running up hills, I'd have to say to myself, you can do this. Otherwise, I'd just give up and fall back down the hill again. Because... What we do is we sort of, but the, this is the pattern, right? This is the way our boasting works. We boast, we make little boasts to ourselves, these, you can do this, believe in yourself, you've got this, to motivate ourselves to achieve some kind of hope that we want, this thing that we want in our future. I want to make the team, I've got to get up the hill, you can do this. I want the job, I've got to put in the work, you can do this. I want the relationship, I've got to have the conversation, you can do this. And so we make these boasts to go after these little hopes that we have in life, Friends, just see how different the Christian boast is here. Very different. Because the Christians boast in a hope that's given to them from God. It's not a small thing we can ever work towards, not something we can achieve for ourselves, but a gift. A gift given to us, a promise held out to us, a future secured for us. And so we boast in a hope of that. It's not you can do this, but God has promised this. And you can see the difference in the kind of hope, can't you? The good temporary things that we want in this life versus eternal glory, the very glory of God, that we'd be transformed into the likeness of his Son. Now, if you're walking in and thinking, what is Christianity about? What is the thing that we are hoping for in this room? That's the end. That's the end, right? To be a people who are made like Jesus, God the Son, to live eternally with Him, loving Him, glorifying Him, like Him. It's so different to our little hopes. It's so different. Because as much as those little you-can-do-this hopes but you can do this boast, kind of do take us up in life. You know, even though you start to go up, you will still go down. Muhammad Ali, he could float like a butterfly and sting like a bee until he couldn't. The hands that once shook opponents then shook uncontrollably in his old age. But worst of all, right, see, there's a trap with these self boasts. These, these mantras that we have that push us forward, if we really believe in them, if we really start believing in ourselves, if we, if we go this way and we don't have Christ, well, these self-centered boasts and these mini hopes, they will put us to shame. We'll have lived our lives for things that were good but not God, things that were temporary, not eternal. And on the last day when we stand before God, without being right in his sight, without his son, we will be put to shame. But friends, see this boast that's being held out to us. It's a boast in which you will never be put to shame. Never be put to shame. See that in this passage. Look at, look at these three things with me. Why will this boast not put us to shame? Well, first, why? Because of the position that we stand in. The position that we stand in. 
This is why it will not disappoint us, because of our position. Just think for a second about the status, the relationship, the standing that we have through Christ. We are justified. We are at peace with God. We stand in grace. Look at verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Friends, here's your status and your relationship and your standing if you trust in Jesus. Justified, at peace with God, standing in grace. And it's the exact opposite of where we stand without Christ. It's the exact opposite. You see, who were we before we came to know Jesus, before his He was so gracious to us. Without Christ, we were guilty. We faced God's wrath and we stood condemned. That's who we were, right? Like, though we knew God, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, we didn't glorify him as God or give thanks to him. Instead, we worshipped the things that he'd made and we worshipped images to represent him. And all man-made religion all across Melbourne, all around the world, is expressing exactly that. As people gather to worship their ancestors, as some of us did, as we go to the temples and bow down before the idols and bring fruit offerings, as some of us did, as we walk into the glittering golden buildings of the high end of Collins Street and High Point Shopping Centre, and put down our hard-earned offerings there, seeking wealth and prosperity and image and success. All the temples, all human worship is rejecting the God who is there. We swap him out. We worship anything else. We swap out the way he wants us to know him and we worship him in any other way. And and kind of so deep and so serious is our refusal to know God and give thanks to him that even though, right, in our consciences, we know, don't we, what's right and wrong. We, we know what God approves, disapproves. Not only do we do the wrong thing, we even approve of others who do the same thing. I mean, you might wonder, have you ever wondered this? How is it that people can kind of group think their way into horrendous, horrendous acts? Like, really evil things. Massive disasters. The, the worst blemishes in human history. How do we get those wars? How do we get those massive systems of greed that cause great financial ruin? How do we get the Holocaust? How do we group think our way into things like this so we not only do it but approve of others who do it? Isn't, isn't the real question not so much how did it come to be as if these were isolated, terrible moments, but when is this not happening? When is this not happening? Just think about every group you're in, the groups you've been part of. You know, from, from the group of girls at school, you relentlessly teased that one friend. The group of guys who have the messenger chat thread where you rate the attractiveness of your co-workers. The, the workplace, right? The group at work where you constantly know how to get an edge on the competition just by bending the rules. Or the family... Because a group really values sport and study over the knowledge of God. We persist in doing things that we know God will condemn and then approve of others to do the same. Friends, even moral, religious people do this. They just do it by their own ways, judging others, even though in their hearts they're no different. Seeking to manipulate and control God by their actions trying to put him in their debt. And all this means, where do we stand, right? Imagine the floor. The floor is where we all would be. On this floor, we are guilty. We are under the wrath of God. We are condemned. But says Paul, though that's where you stood, that's who you were, guilty, under wrath, condemned. That's changed through Jesus Christ. Did you hear that so many times? You're justified by faith. You have peace with God through Jesus Christ. You've gained access into this grace in which you now stand through him. Everyone who believes in Jesus 
is justified. That means you are no longer guilty. God the judge looks on you like in a courtroom and says, though your sins were many, I wiped them clean because Jesus died for you. Your penalty is gone. Though you were here under God's wrath, now you stand here. You have peace with God through Jesus Christ. He's not angry with you. You're forgiven, reconciled, friends with him. Though you used to be here standing condemned, now through Jesus... You stand in grace. The undeserved kindness of God. That's where you stand. That's the position you have. This is where you are in Jesus, justified, at peace with God, in grace. And I just want to ask you for a second, where are you? Like, Are you on the floor here? Or are you here? Are you someone who trusts in Jesus? Do you actually know where you stand? Are Are you confident in that? Well, the way to work it out is, do I trust in Jesus? Now, if you want to explore this some more, and I say, what could be worth more? You know, come to meeting Jesus. Come and find out who Jesus is with us over four nights. Wouldn't it be worth it if it's true? Couldn't you give up four nights with some friends over a coffee and dessert in a nice place where you can ask your question? to find out if that is actually true, that we, sinful people, could be right with God. Because if that is the case, it gives you an incredible hope, doesn't it? An incredible hope. You now stand here. Why is it that the hope that we have is looking forward to a future that won't put us to shame? Well, it's because we can say we stand in grace. We are now these people. We are justified, right with God. The guilt that we might expect at the Judgment of God in the future doesn't hang over us anymore. The anger of God that we might expect in the future is completely taken away. The condemnation we might expect in the future is dealt with and gone. This is where we stand. This hope will not put us to shame. That's the first thing. That's why. That's where we stand. And so, friends, I ask you, where do you stand? Where do you stand? Make sure you stand there. The second thing Paul says, why is it this hope will not put us to shame? Well, it's because even suffering, even suffering can't knock that hope off. It, in fact, God uses it to strengthen your hope. Now, I, I know some of you here are really going through it. And you have been. And it's not been one thing It's just been one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing. And when that's happening, that what you might feel is that I don't know. know. Do I really have this hope? Is this really where I stand? If 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 there is a God and my life is going like this, can I really have sure hope for the future? Surely God's turned His back on me. Surely He's walked away from me. Surely I'm not right with him. Friends, just hear this. Suffering is not a sign God has turned against you. For those who stand in grace, suffering is something God uses to strengthen your hope. How does this happen for the Christian? Just look down, verse 3. Paul says, not only so, but we also, we boast, same word, boast, glory, rejoice, we boast in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Each one produces the next. Just think about this with me. Suffering produces perseverance. Now, that's not just kind of like British stoicism, right? It's not just keep calm and carry on, have a cuppa. No, it's not like stiff up a lip. We've all got to go through it, grin and bear. No, this is the perseverance of faith. The perseverance of the Christian person who continues to trust in God in a really hard time. Like uh, James says elsewhere in the Bible, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And so, as you suffer, you continue to trust God. You persevere. You cling to the hope held out to you through Christ. 
And so suffering produces perseverance. Not accidentally, but learned by the experience of having to continue to trust God in the midst of it. Is that what suffering is producing in you at the moment? For you this morning, I'll speak to you, you who are really going through it. Is it producing perseverance? Maybe you're not suffering particularly at the moment. We ask, is that what suffering would produce in you? See, the person who doesn't know and believe that suffering can produce perseverance, this can actually be somewhere, it's going somewhere good, we're not stopping here, right? But the person who doesn't know and believe this spends so much of their life trying to control their life so that they don't suffer. They're like, I can't go through, I've got to avoid suffering. So they do everything they can to avoid suffering. Controlling their life, controlling their money, controlling their health, their work, controlling the people around them, trying to control God. And, and when they do suffer, the way they go through it is not faith-filled, patient perseverance. Continue to trust. It's grumbling. It's complaining. It's a turning against God. It's a, come on, God. I don't deserve this. Is that you? How are you going to go through it? What will help you to be the person who perseveres? Well, I think, let me talk about your side and on God's side. Right? On your side, Paul says here, knowing. We know that suffering produces perseverance. We know this. The person who knows that they are justified, who has peace with God, the person who knows they stand in grace, knows that when suffering comes, it's not that God has turned his back on them. It's not that they are unloved. It's not that they are somehow now outside of Christ, but they know where they stand. And so they're strengthened to endure. They trust him. They know that he loves them. And can I give you just a practical, some practical advice here? If, you, if you're a Christian, can I say for those suffering, please learn the Psalms. Lean into the Psalms. Learn the Psalms of lament. Yeah. Psalms about suffering, from a sufferer. Learn the protests, the cries for justice, the counselling of your own soul, the hope of answered prayer. Learn this not just because these are just human words that, you know, it's like, a, it's like a, another sad song and you get to sing a sad song, right, and we have a good cry together. It's not like that. Because what's happening as you read the Psalms is you're reading the words of God's King, King David. They become Jesus' own words. So you learn to actually view suffering and endure it through the eyes of God's King. And so God's people through his king. And so your heart gets directed into Christ's own faith and perseverance. Learn the Psalms. They're your suffering guidebook in Christ Jesus. That's on your side. Know where you stand practically. Learn the Psalms. But on the side of God, friends, just remember this. Even though he may cause his people to suffer, he will never let them go. Remember as the Lord said to Israel through Jeremiah, Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. As our Lord Jesus said, This is the will of the one who sent me, that I will lose none of all he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. He will hold on to you, friend. And his grip is strong, even when yours is weak. Suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. Now, it... I hope you know this. It is possible for people to fluke things. Um, there's a bunch of guys here who love playing futsal. They invited me along. I think mostly just to see what I, what I was made of because it's not my sport. Uh, I went along first time, zero goals, one big toe into the floor. I thought I'd broken my toe trying to kick a ball. The second time around, glory. Scored four goals. How about that? Now, I want to say that's not improvement. That's a fluke, right? <laughs> we can all fluke things. You can fluke things. If things balance out to normal the next time I play, it would be zero goals and four broken toes. That would be an appropriate average. But when you do something again and again, it's no fluke, is it? It's, it's who you are. It's, it's, the, it's the tested, proven demonstration of what's going on in you, what you've been formed to be. Now, as you go through suffering and you persevere, 
not just once, but ongoingly, again and again, when you wish you weren't going through it, and you continue to persevere, it produces a proven character, the tested character. It wasn't a fluke that you stood trusting in Christ. By the grace of God, the suffering that produces perseverance leads to the perseverance producing a character where by the grace of God, you've proven faithful, remaining in Christ, unmoved. Now again, that's not automatic, is it? It's not automatic. You know, the temptation is to become bitter. Uh, it's to go, God, how much more of this? How long, O oh Lord? Surely I deserve a break now. This isn't fair. Come on, we just got through the last thing. I think about that a lot with some of my friends. One of my friends, Steph, a friend from Newcastle. We became friends. Uh, she married a good mate of mine, and I think she was about 21, 22 at this point. She was diagnosed with chronic fatigue. And at the time, she was studying medicine, newly married. And her fatigue was so bad that she had to stop studying and going to her house um, and hanging out with her and her husband. And she would sit on the couch and she'd need to ask Dan, can you get me a cup of tea? Can you pass me the remote control? Can you get the next thing? Again and again, she had to ask him. She had just lost her independence. And she didn't know if it would end. And for all the years that we, we lived in Newcastle together, the same place, for all the years we were friends there, it didn't. She lost her degree. She lost her future career. She lost her independence. And her fatigue, she lost her expectations of having children. And it just kept going on and on, and on. And Steph endured. Week after week, year after year, with cheerfulness, and patience, and kindness towards her friends. She would, even in her fatigue, be happy with people coming into her house, seeing her exhausted, unable to participate in things. You know, at measure. But she would do it because she kept pointing us to trust in God. Say, it's, it's okay. He loves me. I'm right with him. He's got my future. Not my future is in, I know I'm going to get back to medicine. I'm not going to have kids. I know this is going to end soon. But my ultimate future, my ultimate future, the hope in the glory of God. How did she have that confidence? Well, she knew Jesus. And she knew where she stood. That's where she stood. Justified, at peace with God. Standing in grace. And so she can endure a proven and tested character. One of the most beautiful people I've ever known. And friends, this character produces hope. It you go through, right, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Do you see how it, this experience focuses and strengthens our hope in the glory of God? Yeah, as we suffer and things that we love are put under threat, are taken away, we lose these small hopes, it leads us, friends, to cling even more tightly to the future that God's promised. We become even more convinced more sure of the reality that God's bringing as we persevere and our character is formed. And even in that process, God uses it to make us a little bit more like his son so that that future hope of glory, the glory of God, right, when we be like Jesus, is being formed in us through suffering, the suffering that produces a tested character, a faithfulness under trial, just like our Lord showed us. The suffering doesn't divorce us from hope in God. It divorces us from hope in this world. And it drives us to cling tightly to the future God's promised. 
It's kind of like the hope circle. But you know, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We suffer. Does it push us away? No. We endure, persevering. We keep on enduring for the proven and tested character. And as that hope is refined and refined and refined, we cling all the more tightly in hope to the future that God has promised us, to be made like Christ on the last day. And so we don't just suffer. Paul says we boast in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. We can be glad in them because by the grace of God, they don't threaten our hope. They don't threaten our standing. They can only serve to strengthen it. Friends, make sure your hope is in that only secure place. The good things that you might want in this life, I hope I get a job, I hope I can buy a house, I hope I get married, I hope I get better, I hope my kids don't get sick. But friends, there's one hope that suffering will refine you towards again and again and again and again. Let it do that. Trust in God. Remain in Christ. He's got you. And the third piece of this is quite beautiful. Why is it that this hope will not put you to shame? God testifies. He makes you aware right now that he loves you. See that verse 5? You don't need to fear that you'll arrive on that last day only to be put to shame, only to have that hope taken away from you. God gives another assurance right now. Verse 5, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Whose love is this here? Is the, it says the, you know, the love of God. Is it God's love, our love for him? I think the context shows us that we're talking about God's love for us. That's what he pours out. God's love for you, Christians. It's more than his pity, more than his mercy. It's his great and free and happy love. The love that he shows you in the five wounds of his son. That love is poured out into your heart through the Holy Spirit. Kind of like the image of poured here is a powerful one. And I think it's just not just poured out in the past, but God is pouring out. There's a sense. It's like I was uh, at Bright recently. We're waterfall country, and we just spent like half an hour sitting at the base of a waterfall, watching it pour out into this rock pool. It's like that, you know, the love of God poured out torrentially into your heart so that it fills and covers every rock so there's not a stone left dry. So the confidence that we have as we wait for that day, it, it's based on knowing where we stand, and it's strengthened by this inner awareness that God does love me. Believer, God does love you. He really does. Let it sink in again. Just know, let it wash over the rocks. We're going to see this again next week. When you pray, thank him. He loves you. When you sing, feel the joy of knowing that he loves you. Isn't it so good that we're gathering together to sing this morning? Now, your emotions, they're not a great indicator of what's true out there in the world, but they do show you what you know to be true inside. If you know where you stand, if you know God loves you, it's beautiful to feel, to express being the people that are loved by God. And things like singing together on a Sunday, strengthen our hope and our awareness of the love of God and help us to feel appropriately the true dimensions of that love. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it, when we sing? Now, you might walk into church and you're like, oh, I don't really know. I'm not feeling that God loves me. We don't always have that, I think, 100% inner awareness of, oh yeah, God really loves me. I don't think the Christian life is like that. But there's the moments, aren't we? We gather together, or we gather around God's word, the truth of the gospel is spoken to us again and we go, yes. And we know and we're aware and we feel the dimensions of the reality of the love of God. That truth is stirred up and made known to us again. And so we rejoice. Paul says we rejoice. We boast. We boast these things to ourselves. We boast it in public. We have a hope 
a hope that will not disappoint us. It will not put us to shame. Friends, make your boast the hope of the glory of God. This hope will not put you to shame. Let me pray. Lord God, you've been so gracious to us through your Son who died for us. Hold on to us. Be our help and our strength. Carry us through suffering. Refine our hope. May we live and long for that last day when we'll be like our Lord Jesus, raised to be like him. And help us week after week as we gather together to stir at one another up, to boast in this hope that we share in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.